Hey, Remo, thank you very much for joining us. The show will start pretty soon, but I have a question. Can I ask you a question? Hello, are you there, Remo? All right, well, here's my question. How do I get a passport if I don't have a birth certificate? I was manufactured in 1998, but not given a passport. I also don't have a utility bill. Ladies and gentlemen, and those of you who are neither, we'll be starting this broadcast in just a metric European minute. Thank you, and I hope that it will make your head spin. All right, Alan, I loosened them up, they're ready to learn. All right. Welcome to this presentation entitled Offshore Financial LLC and Trust Structures for the Conservative Client and Planner, formerly known as European Investment Knowledge. I'm here in the Gassman Studios in Burbank, California with my friend and colleague, Remo Tiefener. Remo works with Kaiser Partners in Switzerland, and we've had the pleasure of being able to work together a few times and to have a few happy common clients. There's a lot of knowledge here that we want to share, not only with non-lawyers, but also with lawyers who do this kind of work to understand what the investment piece and what the investment due diligence looks like from the European side. So Remo, welcome to the presentation. Are you here? Are you muted? Are you soft-spoken? Okay, we're trying to unmute Remo. Josh, any words of wisdom here? All right, well, while we wait for Remo to hopefully unmute himself or whatever's going on, I want to mention that if you I came- I would say that that should have now happened. I hope you all can hear me. Yes. Is that you or is that Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> That's uh, Remo now from Switzerland. I'm pleased to attend um, that hour and I, Hope that everybody attending um, has a good time. What time is it in Zurich right now? We've got five o'clock in the evening, so I'm ahead six hours of you. Nice, so you can start a glass of wine sooner than I can. All right, if you came in through CPA Academy, you just have to answer three of the four polling questions. They'll be remarkably easy today, and I'll even tell you the answers. If you came in through our website, then you're not gonna get CPE, continuing education credit, but if you are a Florida lawyer, first you have my sympathy, and secondly, you will get continuing education credit. If you have a question, you can ask your spouse or your dog, or ask us by clicking on the inverted pyramid and typing in your question, and if we know the answer, then we will acknowledge it. If we don't know the answer, we'll pretend we didn't see it. This presentation will be posted to YouTube later today, and you will receive an email from us that will allow you to watch this presentation an unlimited number of times, or to send it to anyone who has trouble sleeping at night. Please, please, please consider joining us next Saturday, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 p.m. Zurich Time. Jerry Hash, one of my favorite law professors, one of my favorite tax law experts, and certainly a wonderful mentor and chairman of the Notre Dame Tax and Estate Planning Institute, will be here. We're going to talk about recent developments, hot topics, in Estate View software. If you would like to try Estate View software, which I'm going to review with you to some extent, at noon when we're done with this presentation, you can go to estateview.link. You can tell it that your email address is test at test.com. 
Your secret password, which you should not tell anybody, is the word cost. And we are looking for any and all suggestions you may have with respect to the software. So Remo, I'd like to start off by having you let our audience know who you are, uh, where you were raised, what languages you speak, what your training is, and what you do today. Yes, good day to you again. Uh, so my name is Remo Tiefenauer, born and raised around uh, the beautiful lake of Zurich. Um, I'm working for Kaiser Part of Financial Advisor. We are an SEC registered investment advisor based in Zurich. Um, and our day-to-day -day business is looking after U.S. passport holders living in the U.S. or abroad and helping them to achieve financial um, goals, helping them in understanding the differences uh, in banking um, when it comes down to Europe uh, compared with the U.S. Um, we are cooperating with a lot of lawyers, CPAs, and also custodian banks. And uh, that's what we do for a living, um, working together with U.S. clients worldwide. Okay, and one thing I wanted to point out is, as I understand it, you are both U.S. Securities Exchange Commission registered and Swiss registered. So you're following all those rules at the same time, correct? That's absolutely correct. We are SEC registered since 2009, and Switzerland just recently um, implemented a new law, meaning as a financial advisor, we need also to be registered with FINMA, that's the Swiss Financial Market Authority, and we are registered since last year. And all, on top of it, we are even MIFID II compliant, that's European law, similar to the SEC law in the US. And as you could imagine, there is a lot of administrative workload included in our daily business, making sure that we are working in line with all the given rules. Okay, here's a silly question that I don't know the answer to. When you're working with your colleagues in Switzerland, what language are you primarily speaking? We do speak Swiss German. Um, the beauty about Swiss German is um, the Germans do not understand us, but we understand them. Okay, very good. So here is the first polling question for you CPAs. Remo A resides in Zurich, Switzerland. Which of these is correct? A resides in Zurich, B works for Kaiser Partner, C not related to Arnold Schwarzenegger, D all of the above. And the answer is, believe it or not, D. And Josh will let us know when we have finished that polling question. All right, so Remo, I'm gonna turn this presentation over to you now. And what we're interested in is to have a conversation that you would typically have with a US-based investor who contacts you either directly or through a US-based advisor like a lawyer or a CPA and wants to open an account somewhere overseas. So how, how do you describe the situation? What are the common questions they ask you and, and what are the common answers? So first of all, very important to understand is that um, Investment advisor uh, abroad, uh, um, meaning offshore, are only accepting tax compliant business. That's uh, not a new achievement, straightforward, but um, that changed completely in the last 20 years. So nowadays, um, it's very important that we do understand the needs of a client, that we do understand how a client was able to generate the wealth and um, silly questions I would uh, start with is normally from a client you would like to get um, a CV, um, some background about the business the client is involved, documents proving how the money was uh, generated and also getting the right tax documents and then um, it's always a, a question in the beginning what a client would like to achieve. So there is a variety of possibilities we normally see for US clients. Some um, are even opening up a name account in their name or in, in the name of the family. 
Um, there are structures um, getting along, like uh, offshore trusts or underlying LLCs. And there we would need to understand um, what uh, a client would like to achieve, who is going to be involved in, in the account managing. And uh, then we would start the question um, or a discussion about what a client would like to achieve, uh, what's the risk appetite of a client, and um, what um, possible investments a client is looking for. Okay, very good. I want to first touch on the fact that you said that you want to make sure that everyone is U.S. tax compliance if you have a U.S. taxpayer. I want to point out for our audience that it is against the U.S. Wire Act to assist a client in breaking the law of any country in the world. So if a client comes to you and says, well, you know, my parents are in this terrible country, one of the evil access countries, as George Bush called them, and I need help breaking a little law there, you can't do that. It's a, it's a, it's a felony. You could lose your license. So tax compliance is very, very important. And the first thing we tell clients, the first thing Remo tells clients is, if you're doing this to avoid taxes, there's really very little we can do offshore that we can do onshore unless there's truly offshore based income from a business. Otherwise, expect to pay the same taxes. But Remo, some clients do want tax deferral or maybe tax avoidance that they can achieve using a contract that would qualify as a Internal Revenue Code Section 72 compliant annuity or a Internal Revenue Code Section 7702 compliant life insurance policy. Do you want to talk a little bit about those instruments and, and what has to happen for them to be in use? Uh, straightforward here. I, I'd like to add in the beginning, we clearly do not give tax advice, but uh, let us assume that we might have seen in the past that people are using similar instruments. Normally, there are CPAs involved uh, in those topics that is guiding a client through the, the, all those uh, documentation needs. And let us assume that we might also have lawyers on our end checking if a structure is set up the right way. But as I mentioned, we do not give tax advice. That means um, uh, we clearly cooperate with, with lawyers or CPAs just to make sure that everything is in line. And as you uh, clearly pointed out, they are instruments clients might use to optimize their tax situation. And that's according to my understanding, um, a, a daily practice when it comes down to optimizing taxes in the US. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm not a CPA, I'm not giving tax advice, but we clearly need to understand how the structure is set up, who is going to be involved. And normally uh, we go, get um, introduced in the very beginning um, to the leading uh, partner involved in, in, in those structures, meaning a CPA or a tax lawyer that is helping a client um, to achieve a possible optimization. Okay, so from a creditor protection standpoint, in many states, including Florida, New York, Texas, when you have your assets in a life insurance policy, where the owner of the policy is the person whose life is insured, when you have your assets in an annuity contract, then a creditor can't reach those under state law. Does Switzerland have a similar law that would protect those types? of uh, products? Ah, that's a, a good question. As I'm not a lawyer, um, I only um, could answer in a certain manner. Um, we do have kind of a strict law in Switzerland. Um, assets of clients are protected by um, the law. Um, there are similar laws like the FDIC insurance in the US also um, available in Switzerland or meaning uh, granted by the Swiss government. and um, But when it comes down to a structure of a client, um, we just do uh, have our law, uh, similar to the US law, but um, they are um, clearly similar 
law topics in the US as well as in Switzerland. Okay. So a typical client of mine will commonly invest in stocks and bonds directly or mutual funds that hold stocks and bonds or managed accounts where a, a fund manager or a hedge fund might have somebody who's particularly well respected investing in various ways. How does that contrast with what somebody would normally find in a European-based investment arrangement? Well, straightforward here. Normally, um, all the mentioned um, instruments are available. Um, it's um, slightly different in Europe. Um, we are not really involved in any hedge fund investments. But when it comes down to single stock holdings, bond holdings, mutual funds, uh, that's available. We just need to keep in mind that a US client um, is limited to certain uh, products. They are called PFIC. So whenever there is a, a, a structured instrument like a mutual fund or a hedge fund or similar with a non-US sizing, it might create a, a tax burden that we clearly need to avoid. But when it comes down to a, a single stock holding, um, bond holdings, even currency investments, um, the horizon is pretty much open. We do even run US dollar linked portfolios, normally uh, created in a passive manner um, to optimize the cost side for a client. But we might also have clients that even uh, have uh, single stock holdings in European stocks. There are a couple of good companies comparable with good companies in the US. But it's important uh, to understand that our, there are investments that would clearly create a negative tax impact for a client, so-called PFIC. But um, I could imagine most uh, of the investment advisors that are SEC registered are absolutely aware of those hurdles and um, that's part of daily discussions with client to make sure that client are not entering a disadvantage in regard to their tax just having an account offshore or in another jurisdiction but um, there are clearly some limitations uh, Chinese remember is one that we are absolutely not able to do then there are so-called non-deliverable forwards currencies um, like the Brazilian real, we would not uh, invest for clients. But beside that, um, it comes down to how um, the discussion is running with a client, where we need to understand what the need is. Some clients are using a European position for diversification purposes. As you might have realized, the dollar is a little bit under pressure in, in one or the other topic. And it might make sense uh, to achieve diversification by adding another currency than the dollar, by adding other holdings than US dollar holdings. But we do even have clients that end up uh, holding US dollar stocks. So the variety is given. Uh, it, it's clearly very essential that in the discussion with a client, we need to make sure that we understand the need and that the offering is in line also with the tax law in the US, not entering a disadvantage for a client. That's what we do on a daily basis, just helping to make sure that a client is not going to experience a bad situation by just having an account uh, somewhere else than in the US. Okay, now I know from experience decades ago that people would come to Zurich, they would bring money, and they would open what was, I think was called a numbered account, and they would be handed a, a sheet of paper, like a, like a stock ticker paper that said, here's your number, here's your account. I, and they had a feeling that this was going to be kept highly confidential. Um, maybe it didn't pay interest, so they wouldn't have to report it, the income on an income tax return. Things are much different now, aren't they? Absolutely different. I mean, that's part of uh, Hollywood films. Let's put it that way. Um, every and every account needs to be tax compliant. So you might having a, a numbered account, not a problem at all, but it's looked through. 
You might even have a, a trust somewhere in the world holding an underlying whatever LLC, but it looks through, it's tax compliant. And we do have a privacy bank secrecy law in Switzerland. That's important. So clients um, get a privacy, but all, not in regard to taxes. It needs to be tax compliant. Um, you can name your account uh, however you like to name it, but um, it's straightforward, tax compliant. Uh, you get the income uh, statement by end of each year. The F bar filing needs to be done. So yeah, that's uh, that changed completely if you compare it probably 50 years ago. So that's no longer a topic, straightforward. Okay. Does your uh, firm make sure that the clients are filing the right US forms or they just tell you they are and you hope they are? Hmm. Would you mind to repeat that? The line is very bad, yeah. to be honest. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Do, 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 does a, do, do the Swiss firms typically make sure that the client is filing the proper U.S. forms with the IRS and the Treasury Department, or you just advise clients to uh, do that? No, uh, I hope I did understand your question the right way. Um, if we do get a U.S. client that is starting to work to us, we clearly um, help them finding the right documents on the irs.gov page. A client needs to sign the W-9. Uh, 1099 reporting is established and the information clearly ends up with the IRS as well. There is absolutely no room for maneuver. We have no interest or whatsoever in assisting clients that are not tax compliant. And as, as mentioned in the very beginning, we are SEC registered. That means we need to make sure that also US laws are um, respected and that we work within those uh, laws on a daily basis. And um, the good news about the, uh, having a U.S. client is it's probably the only country outside of Switzerland where it's pretty clear what needs to be filed, what are the deadlines. And I must say I like the irs.gov page because you even get a very detailed explanation about how you have to fill out the documents when it comes down to an S corporation, which box you need to tick, on what page it's mentioned, um, and normally per document it, related to a structure, you've got almost a 50 to 20 page guidance from the IRS, how to fill it out, what needs uh, to be done, uh, which deadlines are important, and as we are working very closely together with CPAs, um, if we would have a question or would not know the answer, we would clearly involve the right people to make sure that everything is in line with the law. Okay, so the next polling question for the CPAs, Josh, if you want to post this, the know your customer rules, which of, the, uh, which of these items apply? One, they're required under U.S. and international law. Number two, they require international firms to verify identity. So they're asking for passports, they're asking for driver's licenses, they're asking for verification letters from, from banks, lawyers, CPAs. They're asking for utility bills to make sure you actually live where you say you live. C, they may require annual verification. D, they cannot be avoided. And the current best answer is E, all of the above. Did I miss anything there? I guess not. How are we doing, Josh? Okay, very good. So, Remo, the next question before I get into structures is, I hear about accounts in Zurich. I hear about accounts in Liechtenstein. I hear about accounts in Singapore. I hear about accounts in the Cook Islands. What is your discussion on selection of a jurisdiction and why someone may want to use 
one of those jurisdictions versus other jurisdictions that may be popular or useful? Um, if I understand the question right, and I'm sorry, the line is again not too good, um, straightforward. Um, we are not assisting clients in choosing the right jurisdiction. We might help them to speak to the experts that have the knowledge about the different jurisdiction. They are clearly jurisdiction that might make sense when it comes down to structuring because they've got protection laws, we've got, because they've got creditors law. Um, but uh, in any case, it's important that most of the time structures are looked through in regard to taxes, meaning it, for us, it does not really make a difference. For clients, clearly it will make a difference. And we refer clients with those quest questions to lawyers that have clearly the right knowledge to guide a client in the right jurisdiction, uh, achieving uh, what the client is seeking for. Yeah. But we do not assist the client in choosing a jurisdiction uh, for structuring. That's not what we do. Okay. How, how commonly do you uh, use a company that would sell and store gold in a vault in Zurich? That, that appears to be something that uh, does occur. Um, there are almost every provider we work together with, meaning custodian banks are offering votes um, at, at their bank itself. Um, it's kind of, a, we are not really actively assisting in clients uh, choosing um, storage companies. We would clearly not recommend to go that way. We clearly work together with banks that are offering storage of gold uh, most of the time, and that's important. It needs to be on balance sheet for tax purposes. And um, I here clearly would say it's important what kind of bank a client is choosing. Mine, we all have seen what happened to certain banks worldwide. One to mention might be um, a bank in Switzerland with Swiss at the end. I don't like to say more now. There are certain banks in the US that recently have problems. So if someone is um, storing or using for storage for gold, it clearly is important that the client is choosing a solid, safe bank with no mortgage lending, with no proprietary trading. And at the end of the day, if the bank is not listed, it might be even better. Uh, tier one capital ratio of those banks needs to be high because the last thing you'd like to uh, experience is discussions if your gold is safe because the bank is in trouble. But we would clearly not recommend to store gold in um, companies or uh, similar um, structures. Um, we clearly recommend that the bank is involved. Okay, so. Here is a common structure that we have used for decades. I have an individual, usually single, sometimes married, and then I have an LLC, a limited liability company, which could be based in one of the United States jurisdictions that recognize charging order protection, such as Florida, Wyoming, Texas, Delaware, and then an era, a Florida-based or a U.S.-based irrevocable trust for children or grandchildren. And my client can put investment assets under the LLC. And if the client owns 96% of the LLC and the irrevocable trust for the children, grandchildren own 4%, then if somebody gets a judgment against the client, and the client resides in a Florida, I mean, a U.S. jurisdiction where charging order is the sole remedy, then the creditor can't take away the 96% ownership, can't take over control of the LLC, can't reach into the LLC. The creditor has to wait until there's a distribution from the LLC, and the creditor gets what's called a charging order. 
And some states have the charging order protection. Other states like Colorado and California do not have the charging order protection. Washington state does not have the charging order protection. But there is an Iowa Supreme Court decision, the Ratteriff decision, which says that, that the Iowa law applied to determine whether there was charging order protection when a Florida married couple and others owned the Iowa LLC. So some of us will sometimes use a Nevis LLC or a Cook Islands LLC or a British Virgin Islands LLC because then the, the creditor would have to go to that jurisdiction in most situations to break through the LLC. And that in itself may be enough of a deterrent to creditors that they will settle on favorable terms if somebody gets sued and has insurance that would pay a significant portion of what would be owed. Um, Remo, do you have any words of wisdom on use or selection of jurisdiction for a limited liability company? So I, I could imagine that uh, one or the other jurisdiction clearly would make sense uh, to uh, achieve protection. Here important to uh, mention is um, as soon as you add another jurisdiction, it might is a game changer because another jurisdiction means if a creditor is discussing whatever topic uh, with a potential LLC owner, and if the jurisdiction is not in the US, that they might would need to file it in that jurisdiction. And that could already be a lot um, of workload involved. I could imagine if everything is in on US soil, it's slightly different. But as I'm not a lawyer, I only can answer that topic in a sense that I might have seen um, situations where a nettle seen another jurisdiction was of help. Right. So if my client lives in uh, California and I form a Wyoming LLC hoping for charging order protection, if a California court decides that there is no charging order protection, then under the full faith and credit clause of the U.S. Constitution, a Delaware, Florida, or Wyoming court may have to apply California law. We don't know because there's no test cases yet, believe it or not. On the other hand, if that LLC is in Nevis or the Cook Islands, those jurisdictions don't recognize U.S. judgments. So they basically don't care what a California court thought. They're going to force that creditor to go to their jurisdiction, in many cases file a fresh lawsuit, get a fresh judgment, and then pursue the entity which the creditor can't reach into. So now the tax treatment of an offshore limited liability company is in almost all situations identical to the tax treatment of a, of a US-based LLC, meaning that it can be disregarded for income tax purposes, or it could elect to be treated as a C corporation, or it could be taxed as a partnership, if the client files a form 8832 within 75 days of formation. So remember this, roses are red, violets are blue. Don't forget to file your form 8832. If you don't, there can be issues. But that is the general situation with an LLC. The reason that if even if I have a Nevis LLC or a Cook Islands LLC, I'm going to have it owned in small part by a conventional irrevocable trust for a legitimate beneficiary so that even if a Florida judge were to say this is a bunch of trash and I'm going to let the clients reach into the assets, the judge is instead going to say, well, the most you have is a charging order here under the Florida statute. Mm -hmm. So the next piece of business here 
that I have is above this offshore or US-based LLC, I have what's called an asset protection trust, also known as an APT. Now, I think everyone on this webinar knows that you don't form and fund an asset protection trust if the client has a creditor situation or especially if the client has a tax situation or an FTC situation or an SEC situation, any sort of governmental situation, because then it would be a criminal act of the client and the advisor. Don't do that. But when a client comes to us and says, you know, I have enough insurance, I operate carefully, but you never know what might happen. In fact, my neighbor got sued for millions of dollars and I don't want that to happen. Is it okay if I form an asset protection trust? The answer is yes, it is. You have the right to form one. And number two, where do I citus it? Well, you citus it, you put it where a trustee of the trust is physically located. And you could choose a US domestic asset protection trust, in a jurisdiction like Delaware, Nevada, South Dakota, Tennessee, Alaska, or if you're concerned with the full faith and credit clause, you could form the asset protection jurist, uh, trust in Belize, Nevis, the Cook Islands, Gibraltar, the Isle of Man, and maybe feel more secure. There are a number of clients every year who say, hey, I'm losing confidence in our political system here in the United States. And by the way, clients have been saying that to me since I started practicing in 1984. It's not that different now as it might seem. Um, Remo, we see and we have seen a lot of Holocaust families, families who lost assets in the Holocaust, who lost relatives in the Holocaust, who lived through the nightmare of the Holocaust, who want to diversify their holdings, and they feel that Switzerland is a good jurisdiction for that because all during World War II, Switzerland held everyone's money. The only problem was that after World War II, as I understand it, if Switzerland had your money, they would make it available if you came to them, but they wouldn't come find you. Do you have any, any comment on that or any thoughts on helping people who have political concerns? Um, straightforward here. I think you mentioned most of the very relevant and important things. Um, we do clearly not help avoiding anything for anybody in any case, but um, we clearly respect a certain structure. And I could imagine it's essential that clients and people that have structures also respect their structures the way they behave. Uh, if you have an underlying LLC of whatever trust, um, it might be defined in a manner that you can directly act as the investment manager or the company manager, mean, meaning there might be an interaction with us in a daily discussion about investments. But it's really important um, to mention that we are not assisting, not helping, and would not have any interest if that someone is, is trying to avoid um, a situation uh, that he need or she needs to face in regard to law. Um, but here it's clearly important how something is, is structured um, and because it could uh, create the problem. Okay, I lost you there, but I, I certainly know what you were saying. Uh, the other thing I want to mention about the structure is um, law, law um, in. Okay, so this asset protection trust could be a spousal limited access trust. I might set this up for Marsha and our descendants. I might mind want how to do it. So uh, I would say straightforward. Um, there is nothing to worry about. It's essential that you choose. Right. Okay. So uh, 
as I was saying, this asset protection trust could be in Nevada, could be in Nevis. If it's in Nevis, then the creditors have to go to Nevis to challenge it. It'll be difficult for them to find a lawyer in Nevis to take the case because most of the lawyers in Nevis represent most of the big trust companies there. Lawyers in Nevis are not permitted to take cases on a contingency basis. If another lawyer is admitted to practice in Nevis, they have to promise that they're not taking this on a, on a contingency basis. And to challenge a Nevis Asset Protection Trust, the creditor has to put 100,000 Nevis dollars, which is 50,000 US dollars into the Nevis court registry to pay the defense costs of the trust if the trust prevails, which is why to my knowledge, there has never been a court challenge of a Nevis Asset Protection Trust. But as I said, and as Remo mentioned, if the client is doing this to avoid creditors, you can get into a very sticky wicket because a US bankruptcy judge or another judge might put the client in jail on contempt of court if it's in order to prove up whether the client has control over the arrangement. And there was a man named Mr. Lawrence who spent over six years in a federal uh, prison until the judges decided, hey, it looks like the contempt isn't gonna work. We better let him out. So there, there are articles on this, but another thing I just wanna mention is if you're involved with helping somebody avoid creditors, then depending on your state law and under the federal bankruptcy law, your creditors may be able to get into the a lawyer's file and the CPA's file under the attorney, under the crime fraud exception to the attorney client privilege. So this is not, this is something to be done well before there's an issue. The trust will necessitate the filing of a form 3520, a form 3520A every year thereafter, treasury department FBAR forms and, and other things, which can be quite candidly a pretty big burden because you have to properly disclose everything that goes into that trust, everything that comes out of that trust, loans and et cetera. So let's go ahead and do a polling question. By the way, I have gotten a few of you, maybe eight or nine have said that the polling questions are not working properly. Uh, just let us know and we will make sure to report to CPA Academy that you were here. So a US-based asset protection trust, A, is very similar to an offshore asset protection trust. B, will require far fewer tax forms to be filed. C will be less expensive to maintain. D may be less effective because of the full faith and credit clause of the US Constitution and the ability of a creditor to sue the trustee here. And E, the correct answer, of course, which is all of the above. So Josh, let us know when 99% of the people have answered, including that cat from Connecticut, and we will go to the next slide. Okay. All right. So the anatomy of an asset protection trust, the anatomy of an LLC is not very complicated. It's almost exactly the same as a US-based LLC. But with an asset protection trust, you will have a foreign trustee which will be an individual who resides in the jurisdiction you want to use, or most commonly, 99% of the time, an offshore asset protection trustee, possibly a US-based co-trustee. It is possible for you to have a US-based co-trustee where assets are held by the foreign trustee, but the trust is considered to be a US trust does not have to file a form 3520 or a form 3520A. If US courts are in charge of the trust at the time by the terms of the trust, and the US trustee is in control of the administrative functions of the trust. So there's, that's called the court, and a US court would oversee the trust at the time. So that's called the court test, and the control test. It's right in the Treasury regulations. So then you have a trust settlement 
or a deed of trust. That's the way that the British common law refers to a trust agreement. You have the grantor or settler who contributes assets to the trust. The assets are held by the trustee. The asset held will typically be a directly hold, held financial account. The trustee wants to have an account opened in the jurisdiction to prove that the trust is there. And quite candidly, to make sure the trustee can be paid their fees if the client stops paying them. Secondly, oftentimes an LLC is formed or multiple LLCs are formed and the trustee holds the, the LLC or maybe 95% of an LLC. And then the assets are, are held under the LLC. So that would be a typical offshore trust structure. So uh, Remo, any words to the wise? I know it's a culture shock when clients deal with offshore trust companies because there's gonna be red tape. The client's going to have to go through the investment advisors, know your customer rules, and the trust companies know your customer rules. Some of the trust companies annually contact the client and want confirmation of current driver's license, confirmation of utility bill. And this is not only for the client who sets it up, but also for each trust protector and for each adult beneficiary. And before I before I finish here, before I forget, what is a trust protector? A trust protector is a person or a company who may have certain rights to amend the trust, to replace the trustee, to delete beneficiaries, to add or subtract the client as a beneficiary. Remo, in the normal conversations with clients, what have I missed or what would you add? No. You, you're absolutely right. It's kind of a cultural shock in the beginning uh, to get used to a structure because it's essential uh, that not only the trustee, uh, also the bank involved as well as the investment manager involved needs to make sure that we apply to all given rules. And here, just one example, there are a couple of US documents that are changing on a very frequent basis. The W8 IMWA is one to mention, the W9 is one to mention, and whenever the IRS is updating and amending one of those documents, it's kind of clear that the structure itself needs to update and amend those documents as well. If a settlor or someone involved in the structure is changing the permanent home, you need to go through a documentation reprocess um, if beneficiaries are changing, we might come up requesting new documents. So I agree with your statement. It could be a little bit the cultural shock, um, experience um, a higher workload, because we need to make sure that documents are in line. That's clearly also uh, from the cost point of view, um, something we need to make sure that we understand it because um, time is money. And if we need to go back to a client on a frequent basis, a client um, needs to take care on it just to make sure that all the documentation is in line. But also here, as I mentioned previously, it's essential to choose a trustee or an organization that is used to work with structures that are absolutely uh, in line with regulation and that they also inform a client if something in cha is changing to protect the client for, for any disadvantage um, in regard to the documentation of, of a structure. And there is workload involved, I agree. Um, but the last thing you would like to experience as a client is having a structure that was not filing the right documents in line with the deadline. So that makes no sense. It's, it's essential that an FBAR is done within the timeline and also that the redocumentation process is achieved within the given time to make sure that the structure is in good standing. Yeah, let, let me mention 
the penalty for a late filing of a form 3520 is 35% of the value of everything in the trust plus interest and penalties. And the late filing of a form 3520A every year is a, I believe a minimum 5% plus interest and penalties. And the IRS has been very, very unforgiving in the past two or three years. In the, in the old days, we would just go to the IRS and say, hey, this client set up this offshore trust. No one told her to file a 3520. Here we are, we're telling you before you tag us, thank you for waiving all these penalties. Now you, you have to have really strong, reasonable cause in order to uh, have that happen. Okay, uh, I apologize. I had not realized that when we show a polling question A through E, you can only see A through D, Josh, according to some of the comments I'm receiving. So I apologize if that's a technical issue or a lack of knowledge issue on our part, but this is the final polling questions. And again, we're gonna make sure that everybody if you mention the word polling, P-O-L-L-I-N-G, in, in your questions, we'll make sure that you get full credit with CPA Academy. We apologize for any issues. So here's the polling question. Offshore investments can be held, A, under an individual's name, I assume, B, under a limited liability company or a regular company, C, under a trust or under a foundation, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about foundations while you answer, D, under a life insurance policy or an annuity, or E, all of the above. And I wanna talk about some of these words here. The first word is, what is a foundation? Now, in the United States, a foundation is usually what your house is built on, but, also is typically a charitable organization. In other countries, a foundation and is a different kind of entity. It's a hybrid entity. It's similar to an LLC because there's a manager or a director that operates it and it's operated for the benefit of people, but it's similar to a trust that the people who it's operated for don't have ownership. And now we have these in Wyoming and New Hampshire. So I can set up the Gasman Family Foundation for the benefit of all of the descendants of my parents, for example. I could appoint one of my brothers as the manager and while it's like the descendants are beneficiaries, it's similar to that, but they have no ownership and the duty of the manager is only to not steal the money out of the entity. So these entities, which have been around about a hundred years in Europe are creditor proof in Europe because there's nothing to grab onto. There's no right that any beneficiary has to receive anything. There's no ownership. And when these are formed in what is called a civil law jurisdiction, the courts will not bend the rules. So the civil law jurisdictions do include Liechtenstein in Switzerland. The foundations are common in the Bahamas, common in Panama, and will be taxed either as partnerships or as disregarded entities, depending upon your drafting of the foundation documents. There is case law on this. Um, by the way, I have uh, three chapters in the book, Gasman and Markham on Florida and federal asset protection planning, which you can buy on, uh, Amazon, and Josh, make sure if there's any sales that we share some of the proceeds with CPA Academy's charitable uh, division. But if you want just the chapters on offshore planning, domestic asset protection trusts and foundations, let me know 
just send us an email or put it down in your questionnaire and we'll send that to you. The next thing, and by the way, should we close the polling question or did we? Okay, so the next thing I wanna mention is the life insurance policy. Now, when I said life insurance policy, the first thing you might have thought of was that Woody Allen movie, I think it was Take the Money and Run, where he's sentenced to life in prison with a life insurance salesperson. And this life insurance salesperson wearing a coat and tie walks in to the prison uh, with a briefcase and sits down with Woody Allen. But that's, that's not the, and that's sorry to the life insurance agents on this webinar, but I thought it was pretty funny. But when you think about a life insurance policy, you normally think about a US-based life insurance carrier who issues thousands and thousands of these policies. And you give your money to the carrier, and if it's whole life, they give you sort of a fixed rate of return inside the policy. If it's variable life, then they buy mutual funds, and those are inside the policy. And of course, I'm oversimplified. Well, if you have enough in assets, you can go to a private insurance carrier, and there's well over a hundred of them, and you could give that private insurance carrier $5 million. They will put that under an LLC to be managed by an independent manager that you can choose, somebody independent from you, and then those assets can be invested in the life insurance policy, and the life insurance policy can qualify under the US tax code, which means that there won't be any income tax paid on the income under the policy. And if you're lucky enough to die, there won't be any income tax paid when your beneficiaries receive the death benefit. So this life insurance carrier, which may be an offshore carrier, will take the five million, put it in an LLC, and then procure lifetime death benefit insurance coverage called mortality coverage. And if they put this together correctly, the policy will qualify as a life insurance policy. So the client will never pay income tax on the income of the policy. Some of these policies are set up to own businesses that spit out ordinary income and you can receive opinion letters from well-respected conservative tax lawyers making sure that the i's are dotted and the t's are crossed now when you set this up now you do have an income tax-free arrangement and if it's under an irrevocable trust it may be estate and gift tax proof as well if the client owns it individually then it may be creditor protected both in the state where they live and then also because the jurisdiction where it's formed is not gonna let a creditor in anyway under the rules of those uh, that jurisdiction. Now, an annuity contract will defer income under, as I said, the Section 72 rules, but eventually when you pull the income out and it comes out worst first, then there will be income tax. So, Remo, I think this, pretty much ends the webinar. Um, I was able to answer the questions that we got during the presentation by uh, covering everything but one thing, and that's what I wanna hear you talk about. It's okay if we go a minute over. Um, one questioner said, are people opening accounts in Nevis and St. Kitts, in Portugal, in Spain, to get residencies. So there are US taxpayers, they're concerned that they may want to give up their US passport someday and that they will have a, a European community passport. Do you see a lot of that? And is there, do you have any words of wisdom for that? Uh, let us assume that we see an increased number of people trying um, to find out what possibilities are. Let us assume we saw one or the other person attending a program uh, to get a residency in another jurisdiction. 
Um, there are absolutely different ways and different prices attached uh, to other jurisdictions. Um, there are some where you just have to buy a house for X, Y, Z, 100,000. And there are countries where um, you enter an official process that takes a while. But yes, we saw um, a slightly increased number of people trying to achieve getting another residency. Um, I'm not in a position to know what reasons are. Is it a changed political environment or a changed um, environment in regard to economics? Um, but yes, that's something happening uh, currently. Um, and um, let us assume normally lawyers are involved that know exactly what to do. Um, and we saw that clients got another residencies, but remained U.S. taxpayers. And that's a very important topic um, at the end of that webinar. Regardless where a U.S. person is living, you remain a U.S. taxpayer. But it might be uh, a pretty good situation if you're living in Portugal because they've got a nice coast, good food, and it's a pretty safe environment. Right. Yeah. And, and it almost always, or to my knowledge, it always involves buying a residence there, buying a house or buying a business there. So absolutely we, agree. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Timo, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Your email address is posted there. So I know you're going to get some emails with questions. If you want to share some of the questions and answers with me, certainly not the person who asked, but this, if you want to share the questions and answers with us, or there's anything else you want to share with the audience, let me know and I can send them out a little email later on. Uh, for those of you who have joined us, thank you very much. And now I'm going to shift over here and you're not going, oh, Remo, any last words other than to say goodbye? Auf Wiedersehen. Uh, um, I would like to apologize that it probably was not always easy to hear me because of the bad line. I hope that my comments were helpful. Uh, very much appreciate that I was able to attend that webinar. I wish you all um, a good start to the weekend and thank you very much that I was able to be part of it. Oh, thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, so now a lot of you are using the beta version of the Estate View software. It's somewhat like a mirage up the road. I keep thinking we're eight weeks from completion, but I keep thinking of more things to put in it. So Kevin's got still has a lot of work to do. But I'd like to show you where we are now with the software because we've made a number of changes. Now, if you're new to Estate View, then or if you need to take a biological break, I'll just give you a little three minute tour of what Estate View is. Estate View enables people to illustrate and project estate tax liability. And it has multiple modes. One mode, we're calling it the logistical mode, or, or maybe the planning dashboard mode. We don't have a name for it yet, but this is it. And for this married couple, Carl and Billy Olmsted, we can show them what their estate tax is right now if they both die, what happens if they live a long time and they do no planning, what happens if they do a little bit of planning with a credit shelter trust on the first death, what happens if they do annual gifting, what happens if they do a life insurance trust, what happens if they do an installment sale? And what happens if they give enough to charity to avoid the state tax whatsoever? And I'll come back to this. Also, and this is very this is very new to Estate View, is all of the calculators. We have a calculator for qualified personal residence trusts, a calculator for GRATS, calculator for self-canceling installment notes calculator for charitable lead annuity trusts, calculator for private annuities, calculator for charitable remainder annuity trusts, and more to come. So I'm gonna start off with this married couple because they're very, very nice people. And their names, as you can see here, are Carl 
Olmstead, born June 1960, which makes him 63 years old. I could easily scroll up a couple of years or down a couple of years. And we see that if he doesn't use tobacco, his life expectancy is age 40 by standard tables. We'll go ahead and give him 20 years to live to 2043. He's never made a large gift before and he's retired, so he's spending $375,000 a year each year, inflation adjusted, and in 2034, he's gonna reduce his, his, expend, his spending to 250,000 a year. His spouse, Billy, is 61, and after he is deceased, Billy will be spending 150,000 a year. That'll be a, quite a few years from now. So, we are going to assume that the estate tax exemption of 12920 plus inflation will go down to half in 2026. Or if we don't want to assume that, we can click the, the arrow up and down. A 40% estate tax rate, if they lived in a state that had estate tax, you could increase the rate. We're going to assume that chained inflation which is generally about two thirds of the inflation rate is 2.31%, but we can slide that up and down if we want. And that is the rate that the exemption goes up by every year. So next year, the estate tax exemption will be well over 14 million. I'm going to assume that real inflation is about 4.5%. And these boxes allow me to click on or off whether I want to show a bypass trust, a gifting trust, a life insurance trust, and an installment sale. So if I decide I wanna skip them, I can just uncheck it. They have a seven and a half million dollar house, <coughs> or two houses worth seven and a half million, growing, let's say, at 4% a year. They have 18 million of investments, growing at 8% a year, but they're paying about a one and a half percent a year in taxes and costs. On the first death, they're going to be able to put almost 12 million into a trust or a little over 12 million into a trust that can benefit Billy without being subject to federal estate tax on the second death. They have four children and they figure they won't have grandchildren for another, let's say, five years. After that, They'll have two grandchildren, so they'll have six people they can gift to using the annual gifting allowance of 17,000 per person per year. They have one life insurance policy, but it's a $2 million death, death benefit, but it expires uh, in, 14, in 12 years. After 12 years, there will be no death benefit. It's a term policy. Now, I can put in an unlimited number of, I can put in an unlimited number of life insurance policies here, and I can duplicate the policies and show before and after planning. So in other words, I'm showing policy number one, expires in 12 years, no life insurance trust. The same policy again after planning will have a life insurance trust. And then, an installment sale, which I'll come back to. So where do Carl and Billy sit? Right now, with residences worth seven million five and investments worth eighteen million, if growth if there's growth of only one year here, they die within a year, the total assets are going to be over the estate tax exemption amount and their estate tax will be a million seven. Now, if they do no planning whatsoever, then in 27 years on the second death, they will pay $26 million of estate tax, which is not such a good thing, is it? So the fact though that on Carl's death, he can fund a trust that grows the state tax-free and benefits Billy called a bypass trust. If we click there 
that does get the estate tax down a little bit to only 24 million. I'm sure the children will be very happy to write a check for 24 million. So I don't think we're done yet. Now, the ability to give 34,000 a year to four children, 34,000 times four plus inflation, that's about 130,000 a year for 20 years. I will click on annual gifting and there's that gifting trust it's going to be worth $10 million after 20 years. And after 27 years, if Billy lives another seven years, it'll be worth $20 million. And if I give discounted interest to the trust, then it'll be worth $28 million. In other words, instead of gifting cash, I could have them gift discounted limited liability company interests. Uh, if I put the life insurance in a life insurance trust, it's not going to make a difference here because he's going to die before the term policy. But if I were to change that policy to a permanent policy, so I go there to permanent, and then here it, the policy is not going to expire. It's going to go on at $2 million, and I can type in $2 million there. and uh, then have the after death be two million. Sorry about the time this is taking. Then I have, oh, sorry, two million. Now I can show the savings from the life insurance trust First, I have the life insurance subject to estate tax, but then with the life insurance trust, I've reduced the estate tax and the life insurance is, when it's yellow, it's subject to estate tax. When it's purple, it's not subject to estate tax. I could also show them a second to die life insurance policy that would take more of their exemption away, but would pay, would be there to pay estate tax. Okay. now. They may or may not want to do an installment sale. Let's say they don't. So I'll go here and I'll click off the installment sale. And now after the, the planning that I've showed you, their estate tax is 14 million. I can go here and click testamentary charity and basically say, look, on death, if you would put $36 million to charity, then your children will get 66 million. There'll be no estate tax and your children can handle the foundation. But in addition to that, it could go to a charitable lead annuity trust where your children would actually get a lot of money after about 20 years after the death of the survivor of you. So th this slide can be important for planning. And look, before planning with the charity, the estate tax is 14 million, the children get 88 million. Afterwards, the charity gets 36 million, the children get 66 million. So you gotta run the math, but approximately half of that 36 million will come back to the children after 15 or 20 years using a charitable lead annuity trust. My favorite planning technique, because it is so darn efficient, is the installment sale. So here, these people are at 14 million, and let me click on the installment sale. Okay, now, what have I done here? We're gonna put 10 million of their 18 million into an LLC. We're gonna put $702,000 into an irrevocable trust. So, on day one, they've got 18 million. Day two, they have 8 million plus a 10 million LLC. They have an irrevocable trust that holds 702,000 in assets. They're going to sell a 99% non voting member interest in that LLC to that trust in exchange for a $7 million promissory note. It's going to bear interest at the applicable federal rate, which right now is about 3.91%. So 
So again, what I've done is I've put 10 million of assets in an LLC. I'm gonna keep the 1% voting interest. I'll sell the 99% non-voting interest for 7 million. That's a 30% discount. That is within the realm of reason. And I have now converted $10 million of equities that are expected to grow at 8% a year into a $7 million promissory note paying me 3.91% a year. And I get to pay the income tax on the growth. The sale is disregarded for income tax purposes. So what happens when I do that? I click here on installment sale for a 20 year note and the estate tax goes down to 2 million three. And if I put a little more in, I'll just click here until the estate tax is zero. So I could put 12 million 528,000 into the LLC, $877,000 seed capital gift, and there would be no estate tax in this year of death. Now, just to remind you, while I'm doing this, I can change anything here and all of these scenarios will change. So in other words, if the client says, oh, Alan, I forgot that we also have another million dollars here or there. Okay, well, all I have to do is toggle from 18 million to 19 million, and I've got you covered. And then I may have to put a little bit more in the installment sale in order to uh, get this done, or I can give more to charity. Now, one thing I want to do, though, is I want to stress test this plan. I'm going to get the the state tax down to zero, but what happens if they die earlier? Well, there's another view called the timeline view. And in the timeline view, this shows me what would happen if they die earlier, like they die in 2028. Then you see here's the estate taxes red. So uh, that that is something we're still developing. Kevin's got a little bit of adjustment to do on this, but you see that based on living to 2044, 2043, there's very little estate tax and I can scroll up to get that estate tax eliminated in 20, but, but there's still gonna be an estate tax if they die in an earlier year, as you can see. So, there's something called a self-canceling installment note that I'm gonna show you in a couple of minutes that I think this married couple might have some interest in. Now, uh, you use the Fitbit there, or the Fitful, in order to make everything fit. And of course you're asking me now, Alan, that was a lot to take in. Would you be able to summarize these planning techniques and this information? And the answer is yes, I'm gonna click on generate client letter. And I assume you wanna see all of these scenarios. And I will click generate client letter. And now there will be really nice music or the computer will talk, one thing or the other, we haven't decided which, or maybe it will tell a joke. I don't know, maybe it'll do an artificial intelligence joke. By the way, you can use an iPad, this works on Apple. It is web-based. You may not want to put the exact names or ages of your clients. Uh, if you want to be absolutely sure, there will be a downloadable version for hard disks, but it will be more expensive. So now I have a Word document, and the Word document summarizes what everything we just did, all of the input information, and uh, all of the outcomes and the tax savings. So that is that part of the calculator. I'll show you another uh, couple of aspects of the calculator. They're, they're similar to each other, but uh, not necessarily exactly the same, and they're in various stages of development. But first I wanna show you the self-canceling installment note calculator. Now, Let's say that Carl or Billy are not in good health and have a short life expectancy. 
So it is possible to use a self-canceling installment note or a private annuity, which vanishes on death and therefore allows for a significant reduction of federal estate tax. So if I have a 63 year old and maybe this person, if they're unfortunate, they'll die at age 70. I could use two lives or one life. And then the computer knows which table to use. The uh, applicable federal rate that I'll use is 3.69%, which is the lowest of this year. I mean, this month, last month, or the previous month, which the computer automatically knows. And in order to do a self-canceling installment note without it being considered a gift, the IRS says the person has to be of reasonable health. Not, a, not all of us agree with that. But you see here that if it's a 10-year self-canceling installment note, and usually you go to life expectancy. So uh, if the life expectancy here is 20 years, usually the term of the note is going to be 20 years. So you see that. I'll make it fit. So what do I know? Well, I know that the interest rate on this note has to be 7.0043% using standard life expectancy tables that would also apply for private annuities. And I know that if the client puts $10,800,000 into a trust and takes back a $10,800,000 note bearing interest at 7%, and the client dies in year six, there's gonna be a boatload of assets passing the state tax free in 2043, which is when the second spouse might die. So I can go back now with this knowledge that it would be a 7.47% promissory note. So I go back here and now I say, that instead of a 3.8% uh, note, I'm gonna go to just over seven. And I know that I can go a little bit longer than 20 years, but I'll keep the uh, interest rate at 7.16. I'll stay at 20 years on the note. And uh, if the person dies in year three, which I can uh, toggle back here to 2026, then the estate tax with the installment sale should, will be uh, zero. So I must have pushed the wrong button here somewhere. Let me see here. Oh, forgot to put in self-canceling. Click self-canceling. Now there's no estate tax issue. And the assets are locked up in that trust where the next spouse can't touch them. So, and then I could generate another client letter to show the client the difference. So, if you're going to do a self canceling installment note, you may also decide to use discounted assets. So, here I'm telling the computer to put 10 million in an LLC use a 30% discount. So it's really a $7 million note and that, that causes more savings. The next thing I will mention to you, and I'm not gonna show everything, there are charts that you can use. Um, I can export this spreadsheet. Also, if the spreadsheet's too busy, I could just show every other year, every third year, every fourth year, and it'll also show the last year, and then I can click here and I can ask for a PowerPoint presentation of what I just did. And there is the draft PowerPoint presentation, which explains it and shows the exact numbers and the spreadsheet in the PowerPoint presentation. So uh, that takes care of that. The final thing I'll show you 
is the Qualified Personal Residence Trust Calculator. Now, this is also going to be somewhat integrated with the primary calculator very soon. But as I said, they have seven and a half million of homes. Let's say they put one half of one of their homes into a qualified personal residence trust and they keep the right to use the home rent free for 10 years. Well, the value of the gift is going to be 63.78% of the value of the property put in. There's an 85% chance that a 63 year old will live 10 years. The gift is 54% of the value. And if I'm only giving half of a home, then I can take a discount. So I go to advanced and the home, I'm only giving half of a $2 million home. That's gonna be with a 15% uh, discount. I'll click here at 15%. That's going to be a million seven fifty gift instead of a two million gift. I'm only using four hundred and two thousand dollars of the client's estate tax exemption, and in ten years, that whole part of the home is going to be out of his estate for estate tax purposes. Plus, he can start paying rent after the tenth year, which is going to further reduce his estate tax. So that's going to that little use of $402,000 of the gift exemption is going to use $3 million. I mean move $3 million out of his estate. Now, I can also do other things of course, such as I could have it be a joint life cuper where they both have to die before it would not work. Now the gift is a little larger, but it's safer. But if you do a joint life cuper, it's a little bit uh, more difficult to, to draft. It's still a good idea though. Now I wanna do an explanation of this. I can either hit general explanation and the computer provides me with a Word document explanation of the technique, or I can hit general explanation uh, planners checklist and it will give me a checklist or I can hit PowerPoint presentation, and again, I get a PowerPoint presentation immediately. I know that this is a 10-year Cupert, age 63, value of the gift, 465,000, right to live there rent-free, 98% chance of survival, I guess, when you have both spouses. During the Cupert term, they can live there tax-free, it's growing at 3.78%. And at the end of 10 years, it's worth 2,536. So this will also show the spreadsheet. Again, we are just developing it. It's far from perfect, but those are two of the calculators that we have now. So let me see if there's any questions. The first question is, how do I use this? What does it cost? Well, right now it's free. You go to test, I mean, you go to a stateview.link, E-S-T-A-T-E-V-I-E-W dot L-I-N-K, a close cousin of Lancelot link, secret chump, and put in test at test.com, T-E-S-T at T-A-E-S-T dot com. Your code word, don't tell anyone this, but the secret code word is test. Then you can use it and send me a beta fish because you will be a beta tester. Okay, so I appreciate very much the opportunity to be with you today. All the CPAs have received one hour of continuing education credit and a headache. Thanks again to my friend Remo for talking about how Swiss banking works, how European banking works. It is different than US banking, than US investing, but there are very nice people in Europe who are of course very willing to help get things done right. I hope the rest of your Saturday 
and the rest of your weekend goes really, really well for me and for me. Thank you very much for attending and your patience with this guy who's quite frankly a dummy. Thank you.